Hey you guys, it's Peter, and welcome to my channel, Peter Likes Books. And it feels surreal filming a video on this channel. I haven't filmed a video over here. It's been a while, and I've missed you guys, okay? Um, I don't think I have filmed a video on this channel for the entire month of January, which was not my plan going into January. My plan was that I wanted to film a video every day, every other day over here, um, and I had some, I had some things to take care of, and by things I mean that I wanted to do my favorite books of 2019 and my least favorite books of 2019, um, which meant that I had to sit down and I had to kind of come up with these lists. And so when I was just like, okay, I'm gonna film this video, I would sit down and I would just like start going through it. And I was like, oh, but I love this book, but but I love this book, but I love this book. And so I, I had a hard time coming up with my top 10 list. So tonight I was sitting around, my husband's over at a friend's house for dinner and I thought, I'm just gonna sit down and I'm gonna do this video because I would like to find out what my number one book of, to, my number one book for 2019 was. So I'm actually gonna count down my top 10, but I'm also going to tell you guys who my favorite author of 2019 was too because that kind of came out while I was doing this I have to tell you I was rather surprised by my top 10 books part of the reason was that I came up with let's see 17 books that were my favorites for 2019 I actually read 40 my goal was 100 my goal is like 100 every year my goal is 100 for 2020 and this year I'm going to hit my goal I'm on course for it already um, but you know, there were a lot of great things that happened in 2019 too. Um, so I started a book club in 2018 called Peter's Book Club, but that title is changing soon because I run that book club, which is now an all true crime book club. I run it with my very good GD, Mel. So I will link Mel's information below. She has a bookstagram called Ginger Gonzo Reads. She does book reviews over there and all kinds of stuff. She also has a knitting Instagram, so you can get find that from her uh, bookstagram. But so she and I have been running this book club. We have 2,145 members, which seems surreal to me. I mean, when I started it, I thought, well, maybe 40 or 30 people will join. You know, and I started it because I have such horrible social anxiety and I always want to be part of a book club, but to actually go and show up at like a library or a bookstore or whatever terrified me. So I was like, well, I'll just start this online book club. And um, it has turned into, you know, this just fantastic thing. I also, like when I was looking back over the books that I read last year, a lot of really good books that I read, which didn't necessarily make the list, but I wouldn't have read if it hadn't been for the book club, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm extremely thankful for that book club, and I would suggest to anybody, you know, you don't have to join our book club, but join a book club. It's a really good way to stay structured and read a book um, that, you know, you might not normally read because somebody else is suggesting it to you, or that's what you're reading for the month, and then you can have a discussion about it. There's been a lot of books that I have not been able to stomach through in the book club. And then there's been other books that I've absolutely loved. And, you know, the ones that I loved, other people didn't necessarily love. So you should join a book club because it's a lot of fun. And there's a lot of online book clubs. Goodreads has tons of book clubs. So, yeah, it's a great thing. So, anyway, I sat down and I went through Goodreads and my Goodreads account. Friend me on Goodreads. I, like, accept everybody's friend request over there. And I actually find a lot of my books through Goodreads. Um, I can't remember who it was the other day. Somebody put on Twitter, like, where do you find your the best book recommendations and I find mine through Goodreads and Audible probably 50% and 50% but I went through and I wrote down my top we're gonna do the top 10 but I came up with 16 17 of my favorite books for 2019 you know it's interesting because I don't DNF a lot of books but I have to say I don't typically pick up a book unless I'm really interested in it so by and large unless I'm I, my expectation is here and I'm hugely disappointed I don't read a lot of books that I think are horrible when I was going through it there were very few books from 2019 that I read that just were not great. But I want to go through here and I'm going to give a couple honorable mentions because um, these were books that I thought were fantastic in their own right that maybe didn't make the list for one reason or another. Um, the first one is Vanishing Stare uh, by Maureen Johnson. It was the second part of the Truly Devious series. I love this series. So if you have not read the um, Truly Devious, it's the first book. And I think 
or maybe it was the third book. I don't think it was the third book. I think it was the, it was the second book. Truly, the, the Vanishing Stare. Then I can't remember their third book's coming out. Am I right? I think so. So anyway, I love that series. It is so fantastic. I love the main character, Stevie. Um, I love everything about it. So go check that out. The other book that I wanted to mention on here, I, there were two Christmas books that I read that were fantastic. The first one was Let It Snow by John Green, Maureen Johnson, and, um, oh shoot, who's that? Lauren Miracle was the third person. When I started this, I didn't necessarily love it, um, but as I like read more of it and all the stories kind of you know merged together at the end, I really liked the book. I thought it was fantastic. I love the idea that there was a blizzard as a character in the book. I will tell you, I watched the movie on Netflix. I enjoyed it, but it didn't hold a candle to the book. The book is really fantastic. It really is. Um, and I really think it's a book that you could read right now, like during the winter, um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be a Christmas book, although it does take place on Christmas Eve. Um, so you should definitely check it out. It's a great book. And it's kind of like, I don't know. It wasn't what I expected it to be. It really wasn't. I thought it would be, I don't know. I, it's, it just wasn't ex what I expected it to be. But, but it, didn't, it didn't make the list because... It was good, but it was it wasn't top ten, okay. And then the other one was Murder at Mistletoe Manor by uh, Holly Tierney Bedford. And I got on Audible and I started looking for like new holiday books that I hadn't heard of before, and I wanted to read a Christmas mystery. And this book was just absolutely so. Del oh, by the way, you're gonna need to get a notebook and pen if you want, because I'm not listing them below, okay. So the first one was Let It Snow, <laughs> and the second one, well, the first one was Vanishing Stare, but the Truly Devious series by Maureen Johnson. Then Let It Snow. And then Murder at Mistletoe Manor by Holly Tierney Bedford. And uh, Murder at Mistletoe Manor. <laughs> it was so cute. It was about this woman that had bought this, uh, this bed and breakfast. And she was running it. And she had these two people that worked for her. The, the chef and like her, uh, not partner, but it was like this woman that helped her run the, the bed and breakfast. It just, and it was like this mystery that occurred there. It was very much like Clue. It just was so homey. I could totally see it being a play, like, you know, in some community theater, like, you know, you go stay in some small town in a bed and breakfast and you go to like this, you know, little theater down the street. It so reminded me of that. It was a fantastic book. And I think there are others in the series as well. Um, and then another book that did not, another series, well, it was like a series of graphic novels, was The Unlovable series by Esther Pearl Watson. And it was about this girl named Tammy Pierce. And Tammy Pierce, that was her name, right? Yeah, Tammy Pierce was this character that so reminded me, I've shown him on here before, so reminded me of myself in high school. And um, she just was, she kind of just was out of the loop and she knew she was kind of a loser, but like she didn't care. And I loved that about her. And she just was this absolutely unlovable, lovable character. And she was hilarious. And it just was all of these, and it was a lot of like pop cultural references from back when I was in high school. It just was fantastic. So anyway, and it was supposedly based on these journals that were found in a, um, I think in a, the, these two friends went on a road trip to Seattle and they found this diary in a gas station bathroom, which I thought that alone was hilarious, you know? Okay, so those are my honorable mentions. Let's go into the top 10 of 2019. And then I will tell you, well, I'll tell you my number one book and I will also tell you my favorite author of 2019. Okay, so rounding in at number 10 is What If It's Us by Adam Silvera and Becky Alvaro Albert Talley. Now, I have read everything by both of these authors. Um, so when I knew that they were coming out with a co-authored book, I was really, really excited about it. They did not let me down one bit. I loved this book. It was about these two guys that keep on meeting, and they meet in the post office at the beginning, and it's like these chance encounters that keep on missing each other. It was fantastic. It was really, really adorable. It was everything I would want from Becky Albertalli and um, Adam Silvera. I thought it was really well done. You could tell who wrote what part, um, and, you know, like, I will tell you, the top 10 books that I read on here, I loved all of them. I mean, equally, they could have just been kind of like one, two, and three, like, in all honesty. There were reasons why one, some of these stood out more to me, like if I learned more from it or whatever, or if I felt like there was a profound meaning to it. And typically for me, what takes a book like Above and Beyond is if there is some meaning that has stayed with me over a long period of time, you know? Um, but this was such an enjoyable read, so I would recommend it to anybody. Um, number nine was No Exit by Taylor Adams. And I have to tell you, what's so funny about this is that I read this kind of at the beginning of last year, and I didn't remember this until I was like looking through my Goodreads and I was like, oh my God, this was such a fantastic thriller. And it is a young adult thriller, but it's 
kind of not. I would say it's more of like a new adult thriller. Um, and it's about this girl at a rest stop and she's on the way because her mother's in the hospital. And it was so good, you guys. I mean, it was really, really good. And as soon as I saw it, I like remember everything about it. Like I just read it. Um, so if you're looking for a good thriller, by the way, it also takes place during a snowstorm. So this is very apropos for this time of year. If you're looking for a seasonal book to read, it's No Exit by Taylor Adams. Um, and she's such a great character, and there's just, you really don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know who to trust. You don't know, you know, it's really, trust me, it is really good. Um, okay, well, I mean, if you're watching this video and you're writing down notes, probably you trust me, right? Number eight was One of Us is Lying by Karen McManus. I actually just uh, got the sequel to this on Audible. It just came out not too long ago, and I'm going to be reading it pretty soon. Um... I also read two, uh, uh, two of Us is Lying or One of Us is Lying or something. What, what's the first one called? One of Us is Lying. Two of Us Can Keep a Secret, I think. Uh, two Can Keep a Secret by her that came out this last year too. Okay, now this book, One of Us is Lying, has been, it's received really negative reviews and criticisms from people. I don't know what it was. I really liked this book. It was very trite and the characters were... I, I did not think they were flat. A lot of people are saying they're flat, stereotypical high school characters. They are. They're very CW characters, okay? But there was something about it that was just so enjoyable to me. I didn't really see a lot of the twists and turns that were going to happen. Um, I really liked that you saw the internal struggle with a lot of these characters. I felt like there was a lot of diversity in the book. Um, I don't know. I just, I really enjoyed this book a lot. And I thought that I loved it enough that it made me really excited about anything that Karen McManus is going to put out. I also thought it would make for a great TV show or movie going forward. So I'm really excited about it. It was a great thriller. I'm really enjoying this whole genre that is emerging of kind of young adult thrillers. I really, really like it. Um, you know, Stephanie Perkins did it a couple years ago with, um, what was the book? Uh, the, the one, Somebody in Your House or something like that. And that got a, received a lot of negativity too. And I thought it was pretty well done. I mean, yes, there is a CW feel to it. Like, it feels like you're watching, like, a, you know, remember, like, Lo it reminds me of Lois Duncan back in the day, who wrote, um, you know, she wrote, oh, uh, I Know What You Did Last Summer, and all that kind of stuff. They turned in those into a lot of movies in the early 90s, uh, with Jennifer Love Hewitt, and Nev Campbell, and all that kind of stuff, but, um, it kind of reminds me of those books, and so when I read, um, I don't know. I, I like that kind of, th that young adult thriller. It's, I, they're well done. I really think they are. So, okay, that's uh, number eight. Let's see, number seven. Oh, okay, so number seven was one of the uh, true crime books that we read last year, and it was Columbine by David Cullen. This is such a long book, you guys, but Mel had suggested that we read it in April because it was the 20th anniversary of Columbine. You know, I went into this with an open mind because I didn't, all I knew about Columbine was what I had hear, heard year after year, seen interviews from people, things like that. You guys, my battery is going to die. Hold on one second. Okay, I'm back. So all I knew um, about Columbine was what I had read in articles, what I had seen in interviews, um, you know, from survivors, what I had seen of coverage at the time, things like that. And I remembered it. But it has been a long time. I mean, 20 years. It's been a long time. And what was interesting reading this book, and this book has received a lot of criticism as well, uh, from maybe not getting a lot of things exactly as they were. But there were so many profound lessons in this, and I think it opened such a great discussion within the book club. Mel and I had so many discussions about this because she had gone through that in high school at the time. So she and I talked about what that was like for her. Um, you know, it opened a lot of conversations between my husband and I. I think also not really realizing the impact that Columbine, I mean, truly, truly has had in looking at other situations that are similar to that. One of the things that was the most profound and made me look at world events in a completely different way was having heard that the kids at Columbine did not like the fact that um, the world referred to this event, this tragic event happening as Columbine. Because it was like it took away from their town. It took away from their school. And they wanted to reclaim their school. They wanted to reclaim their town and that was interesting to me you know and how we always do that with these events we always refer to it as these things that happen you know or like dates or cities or whatever 
I don't know. It was just going through the whole process and reading it and, you know, and then watching the interviews. Um, you know, I watched the Dylan Claybold's mother. You know, he was one of the shooters. I watched her interviews. Um, I read a, so many articles. There are so many interviews out there, especially around because we were reading it for the 20th anniversary. There were a lot of interviews from the survivors that go around. They speak about this. There was a lot of aftermath that I did not realize at the time that occurred in Columbine with this going on. And, um, you know, there was like this whole situation with this person that set up these crosses and how many crosses they set up. I mean, it was just so profound, right? And then to find out later, like, why, I mean, you, like, go, it goes in and you find out a lot of why this occurred, which I was not aware of. There's also, like, unreleased footage of the parents' interviews, and there's apparently uh, journals and things that have not been released that will only be opened at such and such dates. So we will, at some point, find out, hopefully, more about what really, like, made these things happen. Um, it's just, it's so interesting when you read it and you get a fuller picture of how this happens, you know, and maybe what we can do to prevent it in the future. And it was really awesome to see this community of Columbine come together, you know, and really support one another. It was just, um, it, it, what I went into thinking was going to be a horribly tragic, depressing book, which it was, also led, left me with a lot of hope about humanity and our society. And so for that reason, um, I was really thankful that I read it. But it wasn't just about reading the book. It was also watching the interviews, watching all of this go on. You know, it was it, that, like, all of it together, um, I think, was inspiring for our future. For our future, you know? And, and, um, so, anyway, okay, let's see. That was number seven. Number six was The Chain by Adrienne McKinty. Now, I will tell you, the next six books could have all been probably number one for me. Um, the Chain by uh, Adrienne McKinty was this, okay, so, first of all, you need to know about Adrienne McKinty. He is this author that really struggled because for a long time he was trying to support his family just by writing. He ended up becoming an Uber driver. He had written this other author. I can't remember who the guy is. I have his hair hanging off my hat. I always do. But anyway, um, and so, like, he was just gonna quit writing. And so this author and his wife, like, reached out to Adrian and was like, you cannot stop writing. So then he writes The Chain, okay? And The Chain is about, I don't even want to talk about it. It is such a fantastic thriller. A friend of mine told me to read it, and I was like, oh, okay, whatever. Literally fantastic. And it's about this kidnapping that occurs. And so what happens is you're kidnapped, your child is kidnapped, okay? And you have to kidnap another child. You get to pick who. But you have to kidnap another child, and then they have to give the ransom up and all this stuff before your child can be released. It's this chain, see, that goes along. But it's more than that, because it's this woman that's, like, not going to be effed with, if you know what I mean. And so... It's, it goes and goes. And just when you think, like, you've reached, like, the climax of the book, it, like, goes further and further. I mean, I literally thought I was going to have anxiety attacks reading this book. I mean, it was that powerful. The movie rights have been bought, so you're going to want to read this book before the movie comes out. Um, last year, one of my favorite books was The Woman in the Window by A.J. Finn. And now that's coming out as a movie in May, and the trailer is out, so you should go check that out. The Woman in the Window. It was fantastic read. Okay, number five was Sadie by Courtney Summers. This was the first book that I read in 2019. I went back and I saw it. It's the first book. Okay, so it's about this girl that goes missing, and it's all done kind of to this true crime podcast um, documentary. I almost think that it was better as an audiobook than it would have been if you were reading it um, physically. I don't know how it would have been done in a physical copy book because I didn't read it. I read it as an audio or listened to it as an audio book. But it was so well done because it had all these different voices, and it went back and forth between her story and the story of the, the podcast. It was fantastic, you guys. It was absolutely fantastic. Courtney Summers is going to be a voice to be reckoned with within the young adult, new adult. I don't know. It was a thriller, and it was fantastic. And it was so detailed and unique and what happened, and um, it went back and forth between, like, trying to investigate the story of what had happened, and the, anyway, it was so good, you guys. It was so, so, so fantastic. And I had gotten a lot of recommendations to read that, too, so if you haven't read Sadie, you need to go check that out. Um, number four was An Absolutely Remarkable Thing by Hank Green. Now, if you've watched my channel for a long time, you know I'm a huge John Green fan. I used to watch the Vlog Brothers, Hank Green and John Green. Um, back in the day, I used to call them the Vlog Brothers because I didn't know what a vlog was. Long before I ever thought I would have a channel called Peter Vlogs, <laughs> Peter Vlogs. Um, I thought a vlog was like a video blog, so I called it a vlog. But anyway, I watched them a long time ago, and then John came out, and you know, he, po he fil or filmed, and then he came out with uh, The Fault in Our Stars, 
read that book, bawled my eyes out, then read everything by John Green. Um, and so I've loved John Green's work. I, Turtles All the Way Down or whatever that book is, not my favorite, but I love John Green's work. So when I found out that Hank Green, his brother was coming out with a book, I knew it would be similar. <laughs> I thought it would be similar and it was, it was very teen angsty. I had some issues with it. I mean, these were people that were graduated from college and they were acting like they were 16 at some points, but um, I loved it. This book was, I mean, it was unbelievable. So it's about this girl and there's this thing on the street. She's in New York City and she takes this like video of herself with it. It's called a Carl and they don't know where it's come from. And they take this video and they post it on YouTube and it goes viral, right? Because all over the world, these Carls have landed. She calls, I think she names it a Carl, have landed all around the world. They don't know how they've landed there and all this kind of stuff. So it's very like alien, but you don't know what, why the Carls exist and what the background story is. And it's about her like falling into social media, but like at the same time, it's like this relationship that she has is falling apart because of her interest in social media. It's just fantastically done. And um, the sequel to this is coming out soon. I just saw that on Goodreads. So I'm real excited about that. And I think Hank Green will be like, not that I think John Green's career is over, but I, I have to say like, this was better to me. Like, this held its own, in all honesty, to The Fault in Our Stars. I mean, it was really, really good. Um, I mean, it didn't have the meaning and the punch and stuff. that, But it really actually did. When you want to talk about, like, um, having kind of, like, uh, it, it was saying a lot about social media in our world and the power of social media and what we do with it and how we use it for positive or negative. It really was talking a lot about that. So the sentiment wasn't missed on me. It was fantastic. And coming from somebody that's been so involved, I mean, John and Hank Green, like, invented VidCon. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, if you... VidCon is, like, this huge thing, you know, within YouTube, and they've just been, you know, a force to be reckoned with within the YouTube community for a long time. So then for Hank Green to come out with a book that is speaking about the power of social media, like, indirectly, was, like, in a viral video, was... It was just, like, this is so, like, funny to read coming from him because he should know, you know? So that was number four. Number three... Okay, okay, I started talking about a book that wasn't even on my list, and I was like... Why am I talking about this? This makes no sense. I need to keep to what I'm talking about. Okay, so number three is Recursion by Blake Crouch. Now, a couple years ago, I think it was two years ago, I read Dark Matter by Blake Crouch. I had never heard of Blake Crouch. I didn't know anything about him. And this book was being recommended to me. So I read Dark Matter. And then I found out that he had written the Pine series, okay? And the Pine series was a TV show by uh, that had Matt Dillon in it. And it was, I only watched like the first season and maybe, I don't know. I think it was, it was only like two seasons and the second season didn't stick to the series or anything. But I read the first, or I watched the first season and I loved it. And I always wanted to read the books. But I thought, this is just by somebody that nobody really knows a lot about this author or whatever. Well, let me tell you, when I read Dark Matter, I, like, was changed. It was such a great book. Well, then he comes out with Recursion, okay? Which Recursion is really about, like, time travel, but that's all I'm going to say about it. Um, it's so much more than that. I mean, it's so, 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 so much more. You know, like, when you talk about time travel and we see all these movies, it's like, you go back and you fall, like, you know, like, Back to the Future and that kind of stuff. But this was really about, like, what does happen if you go back and you change events and things like that. It was so powerful. And then after that, I have to tell you, and this did not make the list, but I just kind of blumped up, blumped them, put them all together because I loved them just as much, was the Pine series. And the Pine series is about this guy, and he is an FBI detective, and he falls into this small town called Wayward Pines. He, like, wakes up in the hospital, and he doesn't know how he's there, but he can't get out of this town, and there's a reason why, and there's three books in the series, and they're very short, and let me tell you, they are fantastic. They are fantastic. Okay, and I think that Blake Crouch, because he's gotten so famous now off of Recursion and Dark Matter, which Recursion was better than Dark Matter. If you're going to read them, read them, dark, read Dark Matter and then Recursion and then the Pine series or read the Pine series first if you want. I don't know. But the third book in the Pine series totally leaves it open ended that there could be like a fourth to it. I wish he would write a fourth to this book because it was just it was so good. It was so good. The end, the last sentence of the Pine series, I was like, ah. Oh! Like, seriously, you're gonna do that to me? So anyway, Blake Crouch, The Pine Series, Recursion, Dark Matter. Okay, number two of my favorite books we're getting, I can't believe we're almost to the number one, was American Predator, Predator by Maureen Callahan. This was one of our true crime book picks. Um, this was about the serial killer Israel Keys, who died in 2012. I don't wanna say any more about his death than that. You need to go read the book, trust me, okay? 
I have told everybody about this book and the people that I tell, they're like, okay, I'll read it, I'll read it, I'll read it. I just had somebody tweet me out left and right saying, oh my God, this book was so fantastic. I wish, I, you know, like it was so good. Thank you for the recommendation. So in my life, I have read so many true crime books. Number one is... I'll Be Gone in the Dark, One Woman's Obsessive Search for the Golden State Killer by, uh, what's her name? I can't, I, just, uh, I can't think. Oh my God. One Woman's Obsessive Search for the Golden State Killer by Maureen John. No, I was going to say Maureen. Anyway, I don't know why I can't remember her name. But anyway, poor, she passed away, which makes me so sad. Um, but the, my second, it's because her stupid name is Maureen Callahan. I'm sorry, Maureen. Michelle McNamara, Michelle McNamara. That's who, there's stuff flying all around. My second favorite book was American Predator. It was fantastic, okay? So Israel Keys, if you don't know a lot about him, he's getting a lot of talk right now because of this book and because of other things. But he was a serial killer that left kill kits all over the country in the United States. And they think maybe other places as well. One of the most prolific killers of our time. He was also, they were terming him as the, like, uh, bionic serial killer because supposedly... He was having surgeries done so that he could become, I mean, it's like, I'm smirking because it's just crazy in theory when you think about it, okay? And it all starts, because he was having these surgeries so that, like, supposedly he had gastric bypass so he could go days on end without eating. I mean, and having, like, he was trying to get his fingerprints taken off of his fingers, and I mean, it's surreal kind of stuff, right? Well, he ended up taking this girl from Alaska, um, from this, like, coffee shop, and then he, like, took her, and, you know, that's a big part of the book and how he got caught. But it goes into the background story of his, like, growing up, the religiosity of his family. It's so interesting, you guys. It is so interesting. And it's done from the point of view of the police officers and the FBI, which I thought was fantastic. Um, there is a lot of homage play, paid to the victims and their families as well. So it's, uh, which is one thing I always kind of look for. So you definitely need to check out American Predator. Second favorite true crime book of life, okay? And that brings us to Peter's number one book, favorite book of 2019. I know there are some of you out there like, well, there's one book that I know that has not made it, and you talked a lot about it, and you guys, I have to tell you, it's been so long since I read this book, I kind of forgot that I read it in 2020, and that is <clears throat> The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Okay, I was blown away. I had started hearing all these people talk about this book, right? Let me just tell you something. When you're telling somebody about this book, do not tell them everything about this book, okay? I have seen people respond to me, and I don't respond to it on Twitter, because they'll say, oh, I didn't know this book was about A, B, and C, right? Let people go into this having no idea of what it's about, except for it's the life of a movie star, and that's all you need to know. That this is about the woman, uh, this is about a woman and her story and her not trusting anybody with her life story and then coming out and telling one person. She comes and gives this interview to one person. And why she gave this interview to one person is a mystery of the entire story. It is so fantastically done. I know they're making it into a movie right now. Let me just tell you, I was so profoundly affected by this book. Not only that, the message in this book is one that should never be forgotten. And Taylor Jenkins Reid has done something very, very important. She has told the story of something that needed to be told that we don't hear enough about today, about something that existed just not too long ago. And she's almost kind of fictionalized, hist well, she has fictionalized history, but it is like historical fiction of something that just happened, you know, in the 40s, 50s, or 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it's such an important book. And I, I just want to make sure that that is said, that, that, you know, that is not forgotten. And I say that because this book needs to be read. And it's an important book to be read. And I think maybe 30, 40 years looking back, I think this book will be getting more acclaim than it's getting right now. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with the movie um, and how they play it all out in the movie. And I, and I hope they don't leave any of it out. Um, I don't think anybody, I have not recommended this book to one person that hasn't absolutely fallen in love with it. Um, I never started off a book <laughs> and, and thought it was going in one direction and then went in another one. So my number one favorite book of 2019 was The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. It's fantastic. Trust me, you will love it. You will walk away and be like, yeah, I was supposed to read this book. I needed to read this book.
And that brings me to my favorite author of 2019. My new favorite author, I would say, of life right now. You know, I've had many favorite authors through the years. I, you know, I love John Green. Harper Lee is probably one of, I mean, because of To Kill a Mockingbird, I just love that book so much. And it has such a huge effect on me in my life. Julie Murphy is one of my all-time favorite authors of life. I have so many favorite authors. But 2019 and going into 2020 has been a time for me where I am getting back to reading to just escape, to just have fun, to maybe get out of the things that are going on in my life. And the, the author that has really allowed me to do that and think about things in a different way and has brought this level of escapism but also having meaning and purpose to the writing is Blake Crouch. Um, Blake Crouch's works, you know, I read three, I'm like getting teary out even thinking about it, reading three of his books last year of the Pine series and then reading Recursion and having read Dark Matter before that, and he has a lot more books that I haven't read yet, you know, really made me think about the world that we live in in a different way. But not only that, he allowed me to get in my car and not be able to wait to turn on my audiobook, you know, or sit at home and just couldn't wait to just listen and read these books because they were so fantastic. And um, he develops characters like nobody's business. And um, he's not afraid to, you know, kill a character off like that that's important to the, the book or risk somebody's story for somebody else's. And um, it, he's very raw and vulnerable in his storytelling. And um, I, I think to just call him a science fiction, fiction writer is unfair. At the end of Recursion, there is a scene that takes place in the house. I found in this house that, anyway, I don't want to ruin it for you, but you'll know when you get to it. I found myself so moved thinking about relationships I've had in my life. Um, in my relationship with my husband and, and how much that means to me. That for a simple science fiction book to do that, it, we can't just call it that. And I think, you know, um, it made me really look at writing and literature in a whole new way. I think we want to divide books into genres, you know, which I do as well. And we want to call things literary fiction or romance or science fiction or young adult or, you know, graphic novels or whatever, or audible books versus physical books versus Kindle books. And I think at the end of the day, it just doesn't matter. I think books have powerful effects. Like so teary eyed thinking about this. I just I I feel like I've just been blessed in the last year and in my whole career of reading to have participated in the stories of so many fantastic people through their stories, you know? Fiction or nonfiction. I think it doesn't matter what genre of book we read or how we choose to read or if we listen to books because I get a lot of criticism for listening to audiobooks, or you know, if we read graphic novels or what we do. I think it's the participation in somebody else's life, learning from that, even if it's just for fun, you know, even if it's just we learn how to escape a zombie apocalypse, or maybe it's how to get through a relationship, or maybe that book has served a greater purpose at that time to help us get out of whatever we're going through in our own heads, you know? When recently, when my dog passed away, um, you know, when I was, uh, we went out of town after that and I was sitting on the beach and I was listening to a, well, I should look it up what the book is called. Um, it was this Christmas novel, a Christmas book that I had read by this guy that's super famous. It was Noel's Diary. What, hold on a second. Let me tell you who it is. Noel's Diary by, um, why can't I think of his name? He's super famous for writing these Christmas books. But I found myself on the beach, and I'm like listening to this Christmas book. Come on, Goodreads. Is your Goodreads slow? Uh, the Noel Diary, and it was by Richard Paul Evans, and there's three in the series, you know? And he writes all these Christmas books. But I found myself at the end of the book, you know, bawling my eyes out for the loss that I had experienced, but also the loss in the book, and the finding in the book. And the book that had absolutely nothing to do with what I was going through gave me some hope that things would be good again at some point. I think that books offer us that. And I think no matter what my favorite book was or what your favorite book was or whatever, that even if we just read one book, even if we just read one paragraph, right, that we entered a world that took us away from everything else. And for me, that is forever why I love to read, have loved to read forever, and will continue to read forever because sometimes there are days that are just too much. And some days, my day is fantastic and I just want to be entertained and all of that is okay. So 
I hope you guys enjoyed my top 10. Um, let me know what some of your favorite books were in 2019, and I will go check those out for 2020. I love you, and I will see you in my next video. Bye.